It's late June and we are well into prime barbecuing season and I know I'm not the only one who thinks that because according to a 2015 survey by the industry group the Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association or HPBA nearly three quarters of American adults own either a grill or a smoker. Now, of course, cooking over an open flame isn't anything new. The, the first definitive evidence of a human ancestor controlling fire goes back to about two million years. But the backyard barbecue is a unique cultural phenomenon, and it has a unique history in the United States where it predates European settlement and has been intimately tied to politics, to culture, and to history. It is history that deserves to be remembered. To start, in the culinary world and among certain grill connoisseurs, there is an important difference between grilling and barbecue. The general idea is that grilling is done with the lid up and heat applied only to one side of the food at a time, while barbecuing is slow cooking with the lid closed, providing heat all around. The difference is important if you're trying to decide what kind of grill you want to use or if you need a conversation starter at the 4th of July barbecue. And it does have some historical importance because several different distinct regional styles of barbecue developed in the United States and how the food was cooked is important to those regional styles. But the history of grilling and barbecuing is intimately linked and most Americans use the terms interchangeably. And of course, barbecuing is not limited to the United States. That claim would be an insult to the cuisine of Asian cultures. Korean bulgogi, marinated meat cooked on a grill, has been around at least for thousands of years. The general idea is that meat was rare and expensive and usually cooked into soup. If a family had the luxury of eating meat that wasn't cooked into soup, then they wanted to prepare it in the most tasty way possible. The meat would be thinly sliced, marinated, and cooked over a fire. However, what's commonly called Korean barbecue today largely developed since the 1980s, deviates from traditional methods and has lots of Western influence. Similarly, cultural traditions of roasting meats over fire were common in China, Europe, and the Middle East, dating back to prehistory. Documented recipes and instructions for meat roasting date back to the Middle Ages. So while, of course, the United States didn't invent the idea of roasting meat over an open fire, it did take on a particular cultural significance here. In 1985, author Steve Smith wrote in his article, The Rhetoric of Barbecue, a Southern Rite and Ritual, in the journal Studies in Popular Culture, that in the South, in many respects, barbecue is taken as seriously as religion. He refers to the many styles of barbecue in the United States as barbecue cults. And while barbecue has particular significance in the United States, the method and tradition in North America well predates the United States. The word barbecue, which has multiple different spellings that are sometimes a point of argument among the different barbecue cults, is derived from the Taino indigenous people of the Caribbean. The term referred to a frame made of green sticks. The frames were used for sleeping, but also for drawing or smoking meat. In fact, early European observers suggested the term referred to any platform. And the earliest known European reference in 1609 was describing a corn crib, a structure built to dry corn while protecting it from vermin. But the references did mention such a platform is used to both dry and smoke fish. And the Caribbean word came to be used generally for the process of roasting on a rack over a fire. You might have heard other stories. For example, that it was derived from the French, where barbecue would roughly mean beard to tail. Or from a restaurant that served whiskey, beer, and had pool tables. And thus was called bar beer Q. And you'll sometimes find that sort of nonsense written on menus in different barbecue places. But Robert Moss, in his excellent book on the subject, Barbecue, the History of an American Institution, notes that the etymology coming from the Taino word is clear and that the Oxford English Dictionary discounts out those other stories. And despite the name being Caribbean and was possibly carried north by slaves who first spent time in Barbados before being moved north, the practice of using such a platform to dry, smoke, or roast various meats was common among Native Americans along the eastern seaboard. The Native American traditions of roasting meat were then supplemented when Europeans brought cattle, sheep, goats, and hogs to the New World. In 1540, explorer Hernando de Soto attended a feast with the Chickasaw tribe in what is present-day Mississippi, where a pig was roasted on a barbecue. The practice was readily adopted by the American colonists, where the term came not just to mean the object, the barbecue, or the practice, barbecuing, but also came to mean a social event. While the practice was popular across the colonies, it particularly took root in the South, where the immigrants from southern and western England were more used to a culture of roasting and broiling meats. The practice was also particularly popular because the colonists of the South favored pork. Pigs had been imported from the beginning of the Jamestown colony, where they thrived. Pigs forage well with minimal care, reproduce quickly, and are the most efficient of all the domesticated animals in terms of converting feed to meat. The cash crop of tobacco requires large parcels of land, and that is also particularly suitable for raising pigs. 
By 1860, the estimated value of the South's pigs was nearly double the value of the South's cotton, although pigs usually left to forage wild in the woods were difficult to accurately count. The pigs are great for barbecue, an animal that can be roasted whole and provide enough food for a large social event matched with the Southern hospitality culture. Barbecues became common social events, and George Washington's diary includes attendance at several. Barbecues as social events figured prominently in Virginia newspapers from the early 18th century on. The events were feasts that most often featured hogs roasted whole, although beef quarters might also be included, and accounts suggest that they were attended by all levels of society, and often included music and alcohol, which sometimes might be drunk to excess. Inevitably, the feast became part of the American political landscape, with barbecues coinciding with Election Day, becoming a subtle way for candidates to ply voters and display generosity without actively campaigning, considered uncouth at the time. But the tradition developed differently in different places. In South Carolina, unlike Virginia, the barbecues weren't a family affair. They were a that were only attended by males, and they tended to be hard-drinking affairs. However, there was something called the barbecue law, which meant that guests had to match each other drink for drink or else face humiliation. In my day, we just called that college. Not only were cultural traditions different, but the method was as well, with regions basting or spicing the meat with different concoctions, the beginnings of the barbecue cults mentioned by Smith. According to Smithsonian Magazine, in July of 2013, these differences were influenced by the tastes of original immigrants, with, for example, North Carolina's vinegar-based sauces being a remnant of Britain's penchant for the tart sauce, whereas the mustard-based sauces of South Carolina represent the taste of the large population of French and German immigrants in that colony. Other barbecue traditions developed because of the nature of the economy and the location. Thus, Texas barbecue emphasizes beef, such as slow-smoked brisket. Traditional Tennessee barbecue is exclusively pork and tends to be sweet, a development of the river trade which allowed easy access to molasses. Kansas City-style barbecue was developed by a man from Memphis who brought the tradition of a sweet tomato-based barbecue sauce but combined it with the Western availability of using beef and other meats along with pork, making it an amalgamation of East and West. As Americans moved west, they took barbecue tradition with them, and new barbecue cults arose. The naturalist and famous painter of birds, John James Audubon, wrote of a 4th of July barbecue in Kentucky. All appearances conspired to predict the speedy commencement of a banquet such as may suit the vigorous appetite of American woodsmen. No personal invitation was required, where everyone was welcomed by his neighbor, and from the governor to the guider of the plow, all met with light hearts and merry faces. Barbecues were especially used to celebrate Independence Day, still the most popular barbecuing day in America. These traditions also started to include other celebrations, like parades, and were followed by patriotic speeches and toasts. These not only reinforced a sense of community, but allowed ambitious men the opportunity to put themselves in the front of the public to demonstrate their patriotism. Thus, barbecues became an essential part of the early American political landscape. As the franchise expanded and a greater amount of the populace was allowed to vote, campaigning went from uncouth to essential, and barbecues allowed a forum where candidates for office could meet and understand the voters. Political barbecues became a part of significant political movements through the U.S. throughout the 19th century, including women's suffrage and prohibition. While the production of wood charcoal for industrial uses like producing metals had existed from ancient times, the invention of a machine to press charcoal briquettes by Ellsworth B. A. Zwyer in 1897 made a convenient fuel for outside grilling. Henry Ford used the press process on wood byproducts of automotive manufacturing. Ford acquired significant timberland in Michigan for the wood used in automobile parts, like the frame, dashboard, and steering wheel. Looking for a way to monetize byproducts like tree stumps and sawdust, he had a plant designed by Thomas Edison installed at his lumber yard, which produced pillow-shaped charcoal briquettes. In the 1930s, Ford started marketing picnic kits, which included Ford charcoal briquettes and a portable grill through his car dealerships, capitalizing on the idea of a motor car as a means of outdoor adventure. Eventually, Ford charcoal was bought and named after the man who managed the operation, Edward Kingsford. Today, Kingsford charcoal is the largest maker of charcoal for outside grills, with an 80% U.S. market share. While barbecue sauce was initially homemade, a commercially produced sauce was marketed in the U.S. as early as 1909, and today commercial barbecue sauce is a $2 billion a year industry. The barbecue culture of the U.S. took a significant turn after the Second World War, when increased prosperity and suburban living combined with the millions of GIs who had gotten used to cooking on a fire to create the suburban tradition of the backyard barbecue. Many suburban homes had elaborate brick grills installed in the backyard, it became a primary method of bringing together neighbors. The tradition changed further in 1951. A Chicago metalworking company was filling contracts to make marine buoys for the Coast Guard. 
A company salesman named George Stephen, who was an aficionado of outdoor grilling, cut a buoy in half and used the top for a lid. He mounted three legs to it and invented the kettle-shaped portable grill. Eventually he scraped together enough money to buy a controlling stake in the metalworking company, Weber Brothers Metalworks, renamed it Weber Stephen and began selling Weber Grills, still the nation's best-selling brand. Competitors Hasty Bake and Charbroil also produced portable grills, although they did not quite match the popularity of the kettle design. In 1932, Louis McLaughlin started the Chicago Combustion Company, focusing on burners that were fired by gas. He adapted the burners for commercial cooking, creating a gas-fired broiler called Broil Burger for use in restaurants. By 1954, he had adapted the design to create a portable gas cooker that was fueled using a 20-pound propane cylinder that was used by plumbers. Today, gas grills represent about two-thirds of U.S. household grills. The industry flourished. In 1952, commercial barbecue device sales were $1 million. By 1959, sales were $75 million. In 1958, one-third of American families had a barkyard grill or fireplace. Magazines representing American life started including grilling recipes, and new regional styles were born, such as in California, a state where weather is amenable to grilling and where grilling took on aspects of both Mexican and cowboy culture, or in Hawaii with their unique Polynesian flavors. The institution facilitated other social changes. Since grilling was generally seen to be a man's province, grilling allowed the 1950s housewife to take a break from cooking on the weekend. Even though gender roles had changed in America, a 2015 survey still found that men are twice as likely as women to describe themselves as the household's grill master. While the percentage of U.S. adults who own grills has remained stable for a couple of decades, grill sales continue to increase, and that's largely because there's simply so much more available these days. In addition to huge numbers of different kinds of charcoal grills and gas grills, there's also now wood pellet grills and infrared grills, and there are even high-end grills that you can operate with a smart app that will send you a text when it's time to flip your meat. The market for grills and accessories in the United States is expected to be about $2.6 billion in 2021, even though American makers are facing increasing competition from foreign sources. Barbecue is an integral part of American culture, dating from before the nation's founding. It combines the tastes of European colonists and Native Americans. It has become intimately tied to regional history and pride. And the backyard barbecue continues to be one of the most popular cultural events in a nation that consumes an estimated 50 billion hamburgers and 20 billion hot dogs a year. In a 2018 survey, some 72% of U.S. grill owners cited flavor as one of the reasons that they grill, but uh, more than half in addition cited lifestyle, 40% in addition cited entertainment, and some 18% cited health. Jack Goldman, president of the HPBA, noted the cultural significance when he said, Barbecuing is no longer just a pastime. It is an integral part of North American living. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.